Okay, got me some tea. Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Uh, Declan! Declan! Let's get Declan up here so everybody can say hello to Declan. Just want to let the brother know that Declan is still doing good. He's a haircut. We're getting him a haircut. But, you know, that's my tea. It's my tea. Uh, just wanted to let the brother know we're doing good. I, I'm, I'm editing. I tried to do a walk and talk, and we can talk about that a little bit, but it was still kind of shaky, so I did a stabilizer on it, and the stabilizer makes it shoot up really closer. It cuts out a good portion of the screen to try to stop it from... from... Uh, <laughs> her. Oh, go get him. Go get him. Try to stop it from shaking. So... But two things I want to talk about real quick in this video is I wanted to read a partial e uh, letter that I got in the, my P.O. box to the ministry. And he gave some good encouraging scriptures I'd like to share with you guys, my brother and sister Christ, but also do an update on um, Bibles. Part of this ministry that God blessed me with is given Bibles. I got a request for 10 Bibles for overseas. And we're go I'm going to try to break it down to five Bibles and five Bibles. So I'm still getting, there's still brethren, there's still a desire for the King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English, around the world. And we're still doing that. I'm still trying to get Bibles out to brethren, so please pray for that. And I mention that because I got this letter from a brother in Christ, and first time ever <laughs> that he dropped some money in with it. Uh, so this brother in Christ, I'll try, he left me an email address, I'll try to email you, but what I'm going to probably end up doing with the money is put it in the pile for a King James Bible, so you've helped put get other brethren some King James Bibles. But what's so important about this letter that I want to read is I got this letter the day after I put out that study that I did. Well, I don't want to say it right, but it's it's almost like a tongue twister, and it shouldn't be a tongue twister because I was doing it how it was done in the Bible. I was trying to say it how the Bible said it when it came to um, okay. I, even I only am left. When I was talking about my depression and everything and feeling like, you know, the ministry is not really helping anybody. I mean, it does, some days it feels like I'm helping brethren, praise God. And then there's some days where you feel like not, you're, not, you're, you're fighting a hopeless battle sometimes. And it's not hopeless, but you just feel like you're fighting a battle and... and you're not really making that much of an effect or being that much of a help to the brethren. So when I was feeling down, we did that study. Elijah, I was trying to think of the name Elijah. Talk about how Elijah, I, even I only am left. You know, and God said, no, you're not the only one. There's, I got a thousand priests that haven't bailed, uh, bowed a knee to Baal, nor kissed him. Uh, so I'm wearing my hat because I don't want to run the wood stove. I don't know why I just, I don't want to run the wood stove, brothers and Christ, because we just, our temperatures, it's 52 degrees outside right now. It's gotten, it's warmed up a little bit, and we're going to get, we're supposed to get a really strong cold freeze in here eventually in the next week or two. But it's just, it's, it's fluctuating. Some days it's warm, some days it's cold, and if it's not cold enough and I run the wood stove, I can end up heating myself out of the house and be sitting outside, even though it's raining and the wind and everything, because it's just, I can get it too hot in here. So I've learned to just put on a little extra clothes when I'm inside, and then if it gets really cold, I can take the hat off, and I don't, sometimes I have my sweater on, I can take the sweater sweater off and just have the, the shirt, and have the wood stove running. It really keeps the house really warm. But, back to the letter. I was really feeling down, and then God has a way of picking us back up, Brother Jesus Christ. He has a good way of picking us back up. Okay. So I got this letter, and like I said, I was feeling like I'm not really doing anything, not really being able to help the brethren or anything, and I got this. It says, Philip. Brother Philip, hi. My name is the Brother in Christ. I live in Mississippi. I found out about you and your ministry early this year, and I wanted to write a letter of encouragement to you at this time, as the Lord has impressed me to do. So... Praise God. He works. They say he works in mysterious way. He his timing is perfect. Which brings me real quick side note, which is why we need to look for that blessed hope and then trust God that he knows what time we're going home. 
His timing, that's the biggest timing. When you think timing, that's what I think of. I used to, really hardcore, is when we get to go home. The catching away the body of Christ, the day of Christ is at hand. When we get to go home, well, God's got everything timed out. Not just that, but he has our whole lives timed out. He knows what he's doing. This is perfect timing. Praise the Lord. And thank you, brother. Your ministry has been a blessing and help to me. I have come to appreciate your ministry more over time. I would like to magnify some specific things here now that you have taught me and parted to me. Number one, a better understanding and awareness of and living with the fear of God. One of the things we talked about is uh, in this walk and talk that I did, the two big points that I pointed out in there was is that we're not living a life of Christ. We're, we're, we're all talk and we're not enough walk. And one thing I didn't mention in that walk and talk is it comes down to fearing God. Do you fear God? This is an old shirt. Just making sure it doesn't sag. Do you fear God? A lot of my shirts are stretched out, so forgive me, brothers and sisters Christ. Do you fear God? Okay. And one of the things in this ministry that we talked about a lot recently is that fearing God is simply that, fearing God. You want to please God over pleasing the flesh. You want to please God over pleasing the world. And it's your actions that dictate it, not your words. Because you have people that say, I fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we talked about it in one of the studies about the fear of the Lord is always, not always, but oftentimes compared to keeping His commandments. If you're keeping His commandments, that's evidence that you fear God. If you're doing things His way... That's because you want to please God, but you also fear God. You fear what, what's going to happen if you don't do things His way. You fear God when it comes to not keeping His commandments. When you get back to what real fear of God is, it's not the knowledge of Jesus Christ, because the whole world knows of a Jesus Christ, but they know the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They can read this book. The lost world can read a book. They can read the story of Jesus Christ and have the knowledge, but it doesn't mean that they fear God. Okay? How you live your life is how you fear God. It's evidence of how you, if you really fear God. There's brethren that struggle with the flesh, that struggle with the world. Why do you have that struggle? Why do you have that burden on your heart? Why is your, it feels like your soul's being, something's eating at your soul when you're not doing right or living right. Because you have this heartfelt desire, you have the Holy Spirit, you have conviction, and you have this heartfelt desire to, to please God, but you also have this fear of God. Struggling with the flesh is one thing, but coming across so many people that just justify sin, justify wickedness, justify worldliness, they don't fear God. And I get in trouble for that, because I say, you don't fear God, how dare you, I fear God, in words, but in deed, in action, do you actually fear God? I see some men on YouTube, they're standing up there, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I, I love it. piercings, tattoos, their wives modestly undressed, and they're just very worldly. And that's like, where's the fear of God? Sometimes using bad language, where's the fear of God? I understand if somebody was a hardcore bad language user before they got saved, and after they got saved, they, God gets it out, but every once in a while something slips out. It's a struggle. It's a bad habit that can come back. If you, if you let your guard down, it can come back. Brethren, we struggle with, with, with sin and wickedness, and we struggle with wanting to do things the flesh's way and the world's way over God's way. But there still needs to be that fear, and that true fear is going to reflect on the life that you're living. Number two, going back to basics and getting my word about Christian things only from the King James Bible and using only those words to describe Christian things. As you say, the words have a specific meaning. Words have meaning. What I've noticed in some of our studies we've done, Brothers Christ, is we've talked about how they took words that God chose and replaced them. First, they added them. And a good example is Trinity. At first, it was the Godhead. Then they decided to come in with their own term, Trinity, as a title for God and a description for God, and they tried to add it to the Word of God. So it's Godhead and Trinity. Then over time, they switched around. Trinity and God, or Godhead. Either or, you know, Trinity or Godhead. Then they took Godhead out, and it's just Trinity. Most people you hear preach on that kind of stuff would say Trinity, Trinity, Trinity. Even Peter Ruckman had a hard time saying Godhead. He said it sometimes. But he had a hard time saying just Godhead, what the Bible says. 
He had to keep bringing in terms and philosophy for the Trinity. God and three, uh, three persons, that's not in the Scriptures. God the Son, it's not in the Scriptures. God the Holy Spirit, that's not in the Scriptures. One in essence is not in Scripture. Okay, but the thing is, is the part of this ministry was that words have meaning, and they do. Okay, and you have some people like in Jeremiah when we had a disagreement with the Christmas. Okay, words have meaning. I got finished talking to a brother in Christ. Hopefully, it's a brother in Christ. Um, a gentleman. He was he was a gentleman. He wasn't it wasn't you know mean or anything. What we call a jerk. I like I told you in my past there was times where I could have been a jerk. But he was a gentleman about it, and we talked about it, and it was just like he was falling in the trap because he was listening to all these preachers that would preach that Jeremiah is talking about uh, craftsmen, and they were, you know, they weren't, it wasn't workmen, and the workman wasn't with the, necessarily with an axe, it's a craftsman with tools, and they were turning these trees into statues, and we've already proven that, that it, they weren't turning these trees into statues. I can, I've already proved that, okay? But these are trees that were being cut down. That's all workmen was with an axe. They're cutting these trees down. Then they're nailing them in one place so they don't move, and they still look like a tree. And then they're decking them with gold and silver. Decking means to cover, to adorn. Okay? And you look up the word decked, never once is it used for gilded in the Bible. Okay? If I'm wrong, show me I'm wrong. But we did a study showing this. And they'll replace the word decked with gilded. Okay? And I kept trying to say, uh, be careful. Let's say I am wrong, and let's say you believe I'm wrong in that passage. Just don't be like these preachers and these people that are so puffed up in their pride that they're adding to God's Word, subtracting from God's Word, and because you want to believe what they're saying, that you feel it's okay to add to and subtract from God's Word. Make sure that your stance is strong enough without having to add to or subtract from God's Word. Okay. But yes, words have meaning. And I've been trying to push that with brethren. Words have meaning. If, if, there's a difference between me saying I have a theory. There's a difference, brothers and sisters Christ, that if you and I are just talking and fellowshipping and we're just talking about things of the Bible along with the world, I'm not saying you can't say the word Trinity. I'm not saying you can't say, uh, you know, different words that aren't in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, you're not allowed to use that word, period. That's not the issue. The issue is, is when you stand there and say, this is absolute truth, you're saying, thus saith the Lord, we say chapter and verse. And we need to get back to that. Chapter and verse. When someone says something, chapter and verse. Uh -huh. Verse uh, Number three. And thank you, brother, because I've been pushing this, and it's really encouraging to me that I just... There's times where I feel like I'm just not doing anything for the brethren. I'm not being able to encourage the brethren, help the brethren. Am I really doing any good for the Lord? This helped. Verse uh, 3. A greater sense of love for the brethren, genuine, real love. Love is an action. Okay? It's not a feeling. It's an act of your will. Jesus said, if a man love me, he'll keep my words. Action. Okay? You're my friends. If you do whatsoever I command you. When you love your brothers and sisters in Christ, how do you treat your brothers and sisters in Christ? How do you treat them? Lately, it just seems like the body of Christ likes to fight a lot. It just seems like debating, fighting, arguing, and to the point where they are falling in the trap of backbiting and whispering. I call it a trap, but just in sin. You're getting into sin and mistreating each other with backbiting and whispering. Uh, bearing false witness, you know, lying about one another just because it makes them look bad and you look good. But more than anything, it just seems like we have that spirit of just fighting and arguing what happened to being there for one another, helping one another. Someone needs a Bible. A brother or sister in Christ needs food and clothing. Sometimes a brother in Christ just needs your time for fellowship. They either had a bad day and they just need you time. Well, I was going to go out and go walk on the beach, but I got a brother hitting me up wanting to talk on Skype. I'm going to sacrifice me walking out on the beach on a beautiful day to fellowship with the brother in Christ to help them, encourage them, to stay with the Word of God, to continue their walk, whatever they're having, a bad day, to help lift their spirits if I can. If they need, if the brother need help physically, to be able to be there to help them physically. True love is action. Jesus, for God so loved, past tense, the world, that He what? He gave His only Son. It's an action. 
We always say if you want God's love, you have to go to the cross, and you do. You've got to go to the cross to get God's love. Okay? But it was an action for God so loved the world that he gave his only God. What kind of love would that have been if Jesus said, oh, I ain't going. I ain't going. I ain't going to get crucified on the cross. No, I'm not dying for the world. But I love you. Wouldn't have worked. True love is action. Okay? Verse 4. So you'll get, like I said, even for me right now, it's just talk. My love for the brethren, when I say I love you and my love for you is in Christ Jesus, I understand that's just talk, but the action, I'm still working on the action, trying to be there for those who want, you know, for those who want me there to help out, you know, want to talk, who need help, okay? But I'm trying to be open to always being there for the brethren. Verse 4. True love for the brethren is not saying I love you. True love for the brethren is showing you love each other by your actions, how you actually treat people, whether they're there, the brethren, whether they're there or they're absent. Number four, a greater awareness of the body of Christ, the church and our role and place and identity in it, and that indeed the church, the body of Christ, we always have to say that today, the body of Christ, this brother's right, the body of Christ, because if you just say church, people think a building, a clubhouse, a, a, a company, a business, that's what these are. Businesses, companies, uh, clubhouses. No, the church is the body of Christ. Uh, I know a preacher out there that every time he stands up, he looks at everybody and goes, it's good to be in church today, isn't it? And he's talking about the building. Uh, no, if he actually believed the Bible as it is, when you get saved, you're in church 24-7. And someone could say, well, that's what he means. Then why does he only say it right before he gives a, a, a speech behind the pulpit? I'm pointing outside the battle buildings. He doesn't say that every day, just, just normally, just when he gets behind the pulpit in the battle building. Good to be in church today. No, church is the people. You're in church the moment you get saved. You, you're in the body of Christ. We're all one in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Is, the body of Christ is a universal body that is supposed to be all accountable to the same truth. We're all accountable to this as the truth. And by this, through the Holy Spirit, by God's perfect written word, the King James Bible, we are accountable one to another. Okay. We're all going to stand accountable to God someday, the judgment seat of Christ. We're also accountable to each other, but our foundation is always the word, the same truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, sanctify them through thy truth, talking about God the Father, thy truth, thy word is truth. Now, I believe Jesus Christ is God the Father. This is God's word. It's Jesus' word. Okay? Accountable to the same truth. Five, a greater understanding of repentance and that it is necessary factor in salvation from which salvation and, I think it's the and symbol, and changed life is supposed to be produced. Right. We teach the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God. What is repentance? Having godly sorrow here. Not the head knowledge that you're a sinner. Not the head knowledge of what Jesus Christ went through. We always say that it's, it's, the Bible talks about fake, uh, faith unfeigned. You can have fake faith. What's fake faith? You have the knowledge and you're pretending that knowledge is faith. It isn't. You can know something, but faith is here. You miss heaven by 13 inches. Repentance starts here. Having godly sorrow in your heart for your personal sins that you sinned against him. And because of your personal sins, he died on the cross. And that's where you get to the belief of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He was nailed to the cross. He was crucified. He bled out. It was God's blood that was shed on the cross to pay for your sins. You confess both in prayer, and you ask God to save you. With the, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. No, the Bible doesn't say with the head. With the knowledge, the head knowledge, man believeth unto righteousness. No, it says with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Unto, it leads to. I can't remember if it says unto or to, but it leads to salvation. In other words, you have to repent first. You have to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ down here, not just have the head knowledge. Don't just have the knowledge that you're a sinner. 
and that sin is bad. Down here, do you believe it? Okay. True repentance comes before salvation. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross comes before salvation. You confess both in prayer because the Bible says it comes before salvation. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have to call upon the name of the Lord, then you shall be saved. Shall be saved. So you've got to repent, believe, confess, and then you ask God to save you. And they're taking out prayer all together, the confession and asking God to save you. And they're taking out repentance. Oh, you don't have to come to God broken, even though we, we have scriptures in the Psalms where it says, God saves such that are of a broken and contrite spirit. If you don't come to Him broken and contrite, having true repentance, that godly sorrow in your heart, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, you'll never get saved. Oh, they take it out. It's not important. And it's only head belief. We call it head belief, but it's not really head belief. The Bible, the more I study it, it's the knowledge. You don't have faith at all in Jesus Christ. You're a liar. You're a fake. You're a fraud. I, I'm looking at my picture in the camera because I can see myself as we're recording. I'm talking to that person. Actually, I'm not, even though I'm looking at the camera like I'm talking to you because I'm trying to talk to you, brother and sister Christ. But there for a second, I was looking at that person right there. I was a fake. I was a fraud. I was in the worldly battle building system and just of the world, looking like the world, talking like the world. I claimed I was a Christian. I claimed to be of God. But I was a fake and a fraud until I truly got saved and born again. I got thrown the true plan of salvation, God brought to God's perfect written word through the Bible version issue. And now I have God's perfect written word. I followed the true plan of salvation. God has saved me. And we talk about when you do things the right way, talk leads to walk. If you did things the right way and it came from here, there's going to be a changed life. It's guaranteed after salvation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The way you look at everything changes. Everything. Your whole life changes. How you deal with things. How you do things. Some things you get out of your life. Some things you do, you keep in your life. But the, the way you do them is different. Okay? Right now I'm doing everything I can to, to please God. Before it was all about pleasing the flesh. Okay? There's a change. There's going to be a changed life. And today that's being attacked hardcore. Everywhere. Hardly anybody that I know. I've hardly come across any of the battle buildings whatsoever that teach the true plan of salvation today. They've watered it down so much. And that's why we've got so many false converts that have the knowledge, but they're not truly saved and born again. And one of the things of this ministry is I keep trying to push the true plan of salvation. I want to see people get really saved and born again. You know, Just as a side note, you realize, Brother Jesus Christ, that Maybe if you study it like I have, with people, people say the term born again, like a new creature in Christ Jesus, as if it's just a statement. It doesn't really mean anything. In other words, there's really no evidence, there's really no action to back up that you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. It's just something you say. Just like some, those people that are part of a club in those battle buildings. Oh yeah, I believe in, in for God so loved the world, like John 3.16. They'll say it, but they don't actually believe it because their life doesn't show it. Why are you going to continue in that sin and wickedness if Jesus died and paid for those sins? Wouldn't you want to get those sins out? Like I said, I have grace for brethren who struggle with sin. There's a difference. Please understand, brothers Jesus Christ, in this ministry, well, it's, I'm trying to be part of Paul's ministry and set a good example. And sometimes I've set a bad example. But I understand that there's a difference between struggling with sin and justifying sin. I've come across so many brethren that some I believe are saved, some I question, greatly question whether they're saved or not, because they're justifying worldliness and sin hardcore in almost everything they do. And that reminds me of me as a false convert. I did the same thing when I was a false convert. But now that I'm saved, I try to line up with this book. I don't force this book to line up with me. I do my best to line up with this book. Okay. It's supposed to produce a changed life. And that's being taken away. 
And if this brother in Christ, if that's what he experienced, the true plan of salvation, praise God, he's a brother in Christ. doesn't matter what his struggles with the flesh are and his failings. Right? He's a brother in Christ. I always try to bring up uh, King David, you know, a great, one, of, one of the great men of God that he, he was a man after God's own heart. And yet he committed adultery and had a man murdered to cover up that adultery. He did some very vile, wicked things. And God forgave him. Now, I say vile, wicked. He, he, sodomy is very vile. That's vile and wicked. He didn't do anything like that. But he committed sin, great sin. Sin that the Bible says you're now worthy of death. I'm talking about physically being put to death. Don't get me wrong. All sin makes us worthy of hell. Any sin, no matter how small. But when it came to the Levitical laws, these sins were great enough that he was supposed to be taken out and stoned to death. Yet God forgave him because he knew his heart. He gave in to temptation. He failed the Lord, and God knew his heart. He still had to be punished physically. He still went through some physical punishment on this earth, but he didn't lose his place in Abraham's bosom. And a whole other teaching as far as Abraham's bosom, but he didn't lose his place, and God, you know, God forgave him. I understand their struggles with the flesh, and people say, I take it too far, like you have to be sinlessly perfect. No, 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 I'm not sinlessly perfect. I failed the Lord a lot in my walk since I got saved, but my heartfelt desire is to serve God and to please God, and I'm struggling with it. Some days it doesn't seem like much of a struggle. Other days it seems like I'm, a, a, I'm on my last leg, fighting the flesh, fighting the Lord. Or not, yeah, I'm fighting the Lord, fighting the flesh. I'm trying to fight the flesh, but then there's times where the flesh tries to get me to fight the Lord, and there's times where I'm trying to fight the world, but there's times the world's trying to get me to compromise, and, to, and what, what it's doing is trying to get me to fight God. And it's just, it's, it's a struggle, brothers Christ, to always try to remain on God's side and be against the world and be against this flesh and always putting it down. But that's the changed life. That's the life of someone who's truly saved and born again. Someone who's like, oh yeah, I, I said I believed, I, you know, and they still love all kinds of wickedness and sin. They look like the world, act like the world, laugh at the world's jokes, the bad jokes and everything. And there's no, you know, they're not vexed by the, the wickedness of the world. Uh, they get along with the lost world. They love hanging out with the lost world. That's always a red flag too. But let's keep going. Number six, that living with the imminent return of Christ in constant mind is the proper mindset the saved Christian is supposed to have and not place our mind in the temporal world or the things of it such as possessions, wealth, holiday, I call them holidays, special calendar days, etc. Nor of course the things mentioned of course the things mentioned in first John two. Let's turn to first John two. Oops. I was in regular John. First John 2. First John 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And here's the warning 18. I want to throw verse 18 in on it. Little children is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it is the last time. What he's saying here is this part of this ministry, praise God, some brethren have turned their backs on it. They've turned their backs on it because they've given up on looking present tense for that blessed hope. We're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope, and we're supposed to be living like the day of Christ is at hand. It can happen any day now. And I've had to correct myself, brothers of Christ. It's not about just saying, hey, I believe that the body of Christ gets caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Or are you looking for it with the life that you're living every day? Now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Why do you think that is? Because we're supposed to live like there might not be a tomorrow. When it comes to lost people, you tell them you need to get saved today. Why? Because you might not be around tomorrow. Tomorrow might be too late. You could be killed tomorrow. The catching away of the body of Christ could happen tomorrow. 
tomorrow or tonight in the middle of the night before tomorrow even starts, 11.59 at night, you die, you wind up in hell. 11.59, the body of Christ gets caught up. You get thrust in the time of Jacob's trouble and now the gospel is a little bit different in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now there's works involved and you don't get saved until the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? But you're supposed to be living your life every day as if Jesus Christ can come back. And you can always tell, once again, you can have a profession of faith. Does the life that you live back up that profession of faith? You can tell some of the men out there that are fakes and frauds that say, I believe in a pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch me with the body of Christ. But they don't live every day as if Jesus Christ could come back today. They're not loving the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're getting into the world and worldliness. Now, I know some men that aren't fakes that have fallen into the trap of being distracted by worldliness, by the world and worldliness. He goes on to say, as Paul said in Galatians 4.10, we are not to esteem days, months, times, or years. Let's see, Galatians 4.10. There was a lot to Galatians that we already did huge studies on. I won't get into it too much, but I just want to read these references. Get some Bible reading in here. <laughs> Praise God. Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verse 10. We are to esteem days, months, time. We are not to esteem days, months. It says, You observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. It's where your priorities are. Okay, there's nothing wrong with having. Uh, traditions, as long as those traditions don't usurp the commandments of God. But I thought this was another verse, but you know, where it talks about one man esteemeth one day above another. You read the whole chapter and the whole context, it's talking about holy days and Sabbath days. You know it is. I've proven it, okay? Um, through scripture, comparing scripture with scripture, it's talking about where the Jews are coming in saying, hey, you believe in Jesus Christ, that's good. But you also need to keep these holy days and Sabbath days. And if you don't keep these holy days and Sabbath days, you're not saved. Or you can lose your salvation. One of the two is what they're pushing on these people. And Paul comes in and says, eh, no. We don't have to keep these days anymore to be saved. That's the summing it up. <laughs> but there's some people that get into, you know, trying to justify holidays, pagan holidays, and fleshly holidays that, le that are sin and wickedness, and they try to justify by one man esteemeth one day above another, one man esteemeth every day alike, let every man be persuaded in his own mind, and they stop there. And I had to get them to get to the next verse, because they, they would either ignore the next verse, they'd stop right there, or they'd read the next verse, and like I said, they'd read it, but they'd just breeze past it like it didn't mean anything. Because the next verse says that one day is unto the Lord. That one day that the man is holding above another is unto the Lord. And at the time that Paul was preaching to the Gentiles, the Gentiles had no days unto the Lord. They keep trying to look at it today where you have Catholicism and all these false religions stealing from Christ, true biblical Christianity and creating their own traditions of men and holidays. And you say, well, you know, it's just, that's what it's talking about. No, it isn't, because back then they had no days unto the Lord. Who had days unto the Lord when Paul wrote that? Who had days unto the Lord? The Jewish people. Okay? It's the holy days and Sabbath days that were being imposed on the Gentile Christians, being told they had to keep them in order to be saved, or, they'll lose, or, or tell them that they're going to lose their salvation. They were trying to bring works into salvation. Doesn't, and Paul's like, doesn't fly. Doesn't fly at all. Okay. Now, like I said, he says we're not to see. What Paul's saying is, is like so we read it, brethren, I beseech you, or I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. What Paul's talking about, without getting into a huge study here, is he's talking about priorities. There's nothing wrong with having traditions of men. Let's say every springtime to summertime, you have a family camping trip. You make a family camping trip every year around the same time. There's nothing wrong with good traditions. You go camping, you sing some hymns by the campfire, you read some Bible stories by the campfire, you lay out under the stars, you get to talk with your family, get to go do some fishing and hiking and stuff like that. It's great. Those are not bad things. Okay. 
But just remember that traditions don't. Oftentimes what Paul was fighting is not something simple like that. Like I just said, oh, you want to go once a year with a family outing or something like that? That's not what Paul was fighting. What Paul was fighting in Galatians is that the Jews were bringing in the Levitical laws, the ordinances, holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon are the three main ones, and they were imposing them on the Gentiles, Christians, saying you still have to keep these in order to be saved. They were still bringing works into it. And that's when we don't esteem days and months and times or years when it comes to salvation. When it comes to trying to add works to the gospel. I see things the way you do against Christmas. The act of establishing such days is not consistent with the theme or mood of the New Testament which theme and mood is standing in awe of the gospel and our salvation? Now, real quick, I'm all for remembering the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. It's a story that we're supposed to remember. I read about it all the time. I, like I said, start your day with the Word of God, end your day with the Word of God. I go through the Old Testament and Alexander Scorvey. I spend most of the time in the New Testament when I start the day and end the day. I do a chapter in the morning, chapter in the evening, and I get through the New Testament, start all over. New Testament, start all over. And I listened to the Old Testament with Alexander Scorvey. Lately, I've been in uh, Psalms and Proverbs, and then I turned around and went through Psalms and Proverbs again because I need to spend more time in Psalms and Proverbs because I spent so much time in the, in the new collection of books called the New Testament. That being said, okay, we need to remember what the what the God tells us. We need to remember the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. I've just done some videos that still haven't been refuted that say, okay, where are all these practices at when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ? Where are we being commanded to treat the, the birth, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day? Not a hell a day, a holy day. Remember, holy day, God ordained. Hell a day, holiday, man ordained. Where is God ordaining this? It's not there. Okay? It's, I, I don't want to go into too much, but... Okay. But the whole point is, is I want you to know I'm not against sitting there and telling the story of Jesus' birth. I'm all for it. You do that all throughout the year, multiple times. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember the life he lived, the story. Remember all these important things. It gives me ideas for doing Bible studies. i got a Bible study coming up. Are you a Paulinian? Because there was something that Jesus said, and I have to explain in context that he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, and then we'll show what Paul said, and they contradict each other. If you're not dispensational. But if you're dispensational... Jesus was right for that time period because what he said was for the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And what Paul said was for the gospel of the kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, that we're, the gospel that we have today, how we get saved today. Okay, We're supposed to read these stories and we're supposed to remember them. It's when they take these stories, these pagan religions have pagan holidays with a lot of fleshliness and wickedness, and they steal from the Bible and try to say, oh, it's Christian. We're doing this for Jesus Christ. And it's a lie. They're not doing it for Jesus Christ. They're doing it for their son or their daughter. They're doing it for their wives or their husbands. They're doing it for the world. Now, like I said, when it comes to traditions, there's nothing wrong with you doing something for your son or your daughter or doing something for your wife or your husband, doing something to help the world out, like neighbors friends, family, but make sure it doesn't trump the Word of God. That those traditions and those desires to please these people around you get you to turn your back on God and displease God. God's the number one person you should be pleasing. This is the number one foundation you should be following. Not everyone else and not this flesh. Okay, Not me, <laughs> not my flesh, this book. Okay? And yes, the gospel of our salvation is important. But what's important also is after someone gets saved, leading them in a life of Christ. Teaching them how to live a life of Christ. Okay. It starts with the gospel. When I first got saved, it was learning the true plan of salvation. Afterwards, God said, okay, here's this book. Get to work. <laughs> and there was a lot of work to be done. A lot of sanctification. Possessing our salvation in fear and trembling... Remember, salvation in this life, that passage, I won't turn to right now, but that passage is talking about you're living a life of Christ. There can still be consequences down here for your actions, your bad actions. There's still consequences for sin physically down here. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. Okay? That's both for saved and lost people because that's the, 
The wages of sin is death. That's for salvation. You don't want to go to hell? Get saved. Now that you're saved, if you lived after the flesh, after getting saved, you're still going to die. There's still physical consequences down here. Okay, you might die sooner. Okay. You know, you won't be as effective for the Lord. You'll lose out on rewards in heaven. So that's where that fear and trembling comes down from. The working out of our salvation. That's what it's talking about, the salvation in this life. How we live a life of Christ today. Okay. It's not talking about ultimate salvation when it comes to getting to go to heaven. Eternal security. Okay, where I live off. Our salvation, our daily lives at all times and diligently, consciously, and intentionally ever engaging in charity one towards another. It's another thing too, charity. Right? The Bible, the King James Bible has it right. They replace charity with love, but charity is more than just love. You can have love for the lost world, and, and that love is preaching the gospel to them. They don't want Jesus Christ, you're done with them. But you still love the lost world because you get the, the action is you preach the gospel to them. You can love somebody and still not do anything for them. There's a lot more to charity than, lo than, than just love. Self-sacrifice. Charity. Giving of yourself. That's why the true word is charity. Above all, when it talks about these three things, and above all, charity. Okay. I wanted to point out and magnify these things in ways your ministry has helped me and encouraged you in your ministry. Thank you for feeding and shepherding the flock and attuning my focus back to the Word of God and the fear of God. Remember, the fear of the Lord is always, it's oftentimes compared to keeping His commandments and doing His will, pleasing Him. The opposite of that is you don't fear God. You fear the world. You fear the flesh. You, feel, you fear men. Be encouraged. Like I said, I got this a day after I sat there and read it a few times. I went a, I, I don't know if I'm going to put out that walk and talk. I'll try. I went and edited it, but it's still kind of jerky a little bit. But brother, sister Christ, I put out that video. I got this letter a day later, and then I had some problems with my computer, turned it in, and got it worked on. They had it for over a week, like a week and a half. Then we lost power. <laughs> we had storms through here where we lost power and everything. And it was just power kept flickering on and off. So I can't do any recording. I can't do any editing. You know, power just come, flicks on and off. But I got this at the right time. And I like to read letters multiple times. And I'll do it in bed at night before I go to sleep. I love reading. I'll print out emails that are long emails about, you know, quoting scriptures and stuff like that. I'll sit outside on the deck when it's sunny or even cloudy, but when it's not raining <laughs> and not freezing cold like windy, I'll sit outside and I'll read them. And I read this and it really encouraged me. And I hope it encourages the brethren out there that want to be in ministry or that are in ministry that remember that, A, you're supposed to be setting the example. Paul said, follow us as you have us for an example. But also that make sure that you're not handling the Word of God deceitfully. Okay? Make sure that this flesh isn't getting in the way. You're not forcing this to conform to this, to this. Okay? That you're still encouraging the brethren to do what's right and to live a life of Christ. Be encouraged. Thank you, brother. And all the other brethren that emailed me. This wasn't the only one. I got some emails and some messages from other brethren. A seventh thing I forgot about is that you helped me to see the importance of having and focusing on thankfulness at all times, even amidst the trials and persecution and suffering for Christ's sake. And I'm going to stop there. Uh, he said a lot of things, but he, uh, but yeah, the whole point of the Bible is you're supposed to give God glory in all things, and you're supposed to give Him thanks in all things. Okay? And if it's something you can't give Him glory for or thanks for, then you shouldn't be doing it. And I've always pushed this because I've had people say, well, I can thank God for the money he gave me to buy booze or video games or whatever that's sinful and wicked. Right? Uh, it's like someone saying, I can, you know, just, yeah, I can thank God for the money to buy all this wickedness and sin. Or I can thank God for giving me the strength to do all this wickedness and sin. But they leave out the wickedness and sin and they try to claim, well, I can just thank God for the money. Or I can thank God for the strength. Well, what would you do with that strength? What would you do with that money? Could you thank God for what you did with it? No, then you shouldn't have been doing it. 
okay? But the other biggest thing, because I see this along a lot, of, a lot of fakes and frauds. Well, I can just thank God, thank God, thank God. It's like, but what you're doing, you can't really be thanking God and giving Him glory. He wants no part in it. He doesn't want any part in sin and wickedness. Okay? The world's way that go contrary to God's way. He's not a he's not a, he's not a man. A, God is not a man that he should repent. But uh, Paul was talking about how he's not a respecter of persons. Peter said it. Paul said it. He's not a respecter of persons. Okay. He's not he's not into being a people pleaser like trying to please the masses. He's into the individual, and we're supposed to be about pleasing God. Okay. But we're supposed to give thanks in all things. Here's the second part to that. Even when bad things happen, if you're doing right, because remember we just talked about work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. If you're doing wrong and bad things are happening, that's because of you. You need to take it to the Lord, repent, forsake the bad things that you're doing, get your life right with God, and God will take care of the rest. But you're doing that, you're living right, you're doing right, the world's falling apart, Everything around you, the vexation of the lost world, how you're getting treated, you're going through some bad times, you're going through some hard times, and bad things are happening to you, not because of you, not because of your faults and your failings, but just because that's how the wicked world is getting. It's getting worse and worse out there. Uh, you need to work on thanking God. And even when it's my fault, when I repent, forsake, and, I get, and God gets me through it, I thank God for getting me through it. I thank God for giving me the strength to repent and that conviction to motivate you to repent. Having that God of sorrow. Repentance starts before you get saved at salvation. We say at salvation. But it happens before God saves you. And that repentance, that godly sorrow needs to remain here for the rest of your walk until God calls you home in death or He calls us home in life. Catching away. Right? We need to have that, that sorrow in our heart and that conviction, that fear of God and when we fail God, having that, that repentance needs to be there. But we need to be giving God thanks in all things and giving Him glory in all things. Okay? But I got this and I wanted to share this because you shared it with me. I'm sharing it with you, brothers and sisters Christ. Those are really main, good main points. And it shows, it just, it was so encouraging because I felt like I was just, you know, in one ear, out the other with a lot of people. Because a lot the way a lot of people respond just seemed like it was in one ear and out the other. It's like they didn't even watch the videos. And I know there's other men in ministry out there that's had to deal with that where it's just like, I made a video, I, I, poured, I put my heart into it, I was trying to please God, I did a good study on the Bible and everything, and put out an hour, maybe a two-parter, two-hour vi uh, Bible study video. And it just seems like people don't want Bible study videos today. Or it just seems like they watched it and it's like they weren't even listening. They heard it, they heard it in one ear, out the other, <laughs> but they weren't listening. Okay. This is a smack to my face. This is God slapping me like he did uh, Elijah. I, Lord, I alone am left. I'm the only one that's really listening. Nobody just seems to want to listen. I, I just think like this is just a waste. And then this come, I get this in the mail and it's just a slap across the face. And it's like, uh, wake up. Okay. You're doing some good for the Lord. And this isn't a pat on my back. I am so grateful to be used by the Lord. Okay. I'm so grateful and blessed to be used by the Lord. So, going back to the money thing, like I said, it's the first time. I remember a lot of brethren saying, well, I'd like to donate, I'd like to donate. And I told them, I said, A, I don't need donations. God has provided for me. He's provided a roof for me. He's provided clothing for me. He's provided food for me. Okay? If God lays it on your heart like he did this brother in Christ, and you just really have to give, I told brethren, I, I don't turn down donations. I just don't push them. The Bible says you're not to give out of necessity but of a cheerful heart. Sometimes you've got to remind, be reminded, love for your brothers and sisters of Christ. If you've got brethren that need Bibles, you've got brethren that need food and raiment, you've got brethren that need your time, to sacrifice some of your time to be there for your brothers and sisters. That's true love for your brothers and sisters of Christ. Sometimes we need to do teachings on charity, self-sacrifice, giving of yourself to help your brothers and sisters in Christ out. But I'm not turning this YouTube channel into a business Okay, a money-making business. Okay. If I need help, I'll ask for help. Right now, God's got me covered. Praise God. I just, I just, I just want to say that because you know your enemies—they're always going to be ready to pounce on you. But like I said, what I'm probably going to do with this money—it's going to sit on the wall for a little bit. But 
I'm going to take this money and I'm going to, uh, God's put on my heart to put it into the, the funds that I have for doing Bibles. Because I just got a huge order. Usually it's just two Bibles. You know, every three or four months they need two or three Bibles. And I'm like, okay, that's easy. Uh, by the time I've bought the Bibles, like say, we're getting some of the nice Bibles for some of the brethren overseas. Uh, they can get the really cheap ones. They can get the ones that fall apart. But we're getting them really nice Bibles. So anywhere between 60 to to $100 a Bible. So doing two or three Bibles every three or four months is something I can handle. But when you get an order of 10 Bibles all at once, and part of it's probably my fault because I went through a three-month of, um, like I said, a depression where I just kind of, backed away from the world, but I also backed away from brethren. And this was kind of stacking up. He probably was trying, they're probably trying to hit me up for Bibles when I wasn't listening. So I, I apologize to my brother, sister Christ for letting you down. Um, but yeah, I'm going to put that money towards that because it's usually for every two to three books, three Bibles, it's like an extra 85 to to $100 just in mailing fees so it takes about three to four for let's say three bibles it'll take like close to four hundred dollars to mail those bibles out so we're going to do five bibles which means it might be around six hundred i don't know seven hundred dollars to get these five bibles out we're going to make it happen because the lord has blessed me and i bet you know just 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 talking a little bit so and then we'll end it I've been doing a lot of saving up, Brother Says Christ, for I want to get the water system redone. I want to get the deck. It needs to be repaired. Uh, not repaired like it's falling apart. Repaired it needs to be. Well, yeah, it's getting old. Uh, it needs to be re repaired as far as all this, the, not the foundation. The foundation still pretty solid. The beams are still solid in great condition. It's the wood. It's the wood that's on top that, that you walk on <laughs> and you get to touch. Um, it's, it's really, I've already replaced lots of, of the deck, little wood pieces here and there, but it really needs a real overhaul. So I've been saving up for the water system, I've been saving up for the deck, um, and then I, I trust the Lord. And if something like this happens, like I said, charity, self-sacrifice. This isn't me patting my back on the back, I'm trying to you be a good example to the brethren. There's sometimes where, is the water system, I'm not, without going into it, is the way my water system, is it working? Yes. Am I getting water? Yes. Okay, so, and everything okay? Yes. Okay, well then, I'm going to get Bibles for people. If this whole, if my water system shut down, that'd be a different story. If the deck started falling down the hillside, that'd be a different story. But I think I'd still try to do Bibles because, in my heart, that's something that'll last forever. You know, get, getting a Bible to a brother or sister in Christ that wants a Bible. There's times that I, I, I always save all my cheap Bibles, used Bibles, for handing out to people when I go out and do gospel tracting sometimes. And I remember handing a guy a Bible, and I know he was probably putting on a show because he was one of the homeless guys, and he needed to ride around town. I drove him to a couple places, and I talked with him about the true plan of salvation, and I handed him a King James Bible. I always keep a King James Bible in my glove box um, or in the side door. And I gave him one of those, and I said, listen, this book is important. He's like, oh, yeah, because he, he noticed my sweatshirt that said King James. I said, King James, author, AV, authorized version 1611. And he, that's what started the whole conversation, but I think he could have pointed it out because he just wanted a ride. But it was a blessing for me to drive him around, talk to him about the Word of God when it came to the plan of salvation, and talked to him about the Bible version issue, and I gave him that King James Bible and said, this is God's Word. You have people saying, well, anything can be God's Word. No, I'm telling you, this is God's Word, and I'm putting it in your hands. What you do with it from this point on is on you. And I told him that. Okay? So there's times that I'll give people Bibles out there that still seems like a blessing, but when you have a brother or sister in Christ overseas that can't get King James Bibles where they're at, and they desperately want them, it... I feel great when I try to please God and be a good servant to the brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a good feeling, brothers and sisters Christ. So, without going on too much, forgive me for jabbering too much. Um, but I want to thank the brethren for their prayers. I want to thank the emails again and for the letter from this brother in Christ and the letters I get from brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. My PO box is still there. The email account is still up and running. 
I just, I miss face-to-face -face fellowship. I need to end it. I'm sorry. I just, I'm about to go into another point, another thing. My life, I might not be the only one. My whole life, I've always had a hard time with writing letters, and it's my fault. Writing letters and staying in touch with emails hardcore. I can do one thing like Skyping where you just do messages or Facebook Messenger where you just do a little sentence and you go back and forth every so often. But I'm talking about writing an email with somebody. He wrote one me this week, I write one back. Then he writes one, I write one, and we go back and forth with just emails or letters. My grandparents in, in Oklahoma, they really were hardcore letter writers. And if I didn't write letters, I wasn't keeping in touch. I called them every month. I was in the military and everything. I called them every month and I talked with them to see how they're doing and everything. But in their eyes, if I didn't write a letter, I wasn't keeping in touch. I just always had problems with that. So please forgive me, brothers and Christ. I'm working on it. Something I'm working on. That when I get an email, I like to read it for a little while and then I'll respond. Because I want to make sure, you know, I'm not... Sometimes if you're quick to answer, you might not give a good answer. You might get part of the answer, not the whole answer. You know, like I talked about with that uh, man that I came across on the beach. He saw my sticker, the magnet that said, if you died tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? And he's like, ah, I'm going to be in hell. There's certain situations where you have to give a quick answer because you're on the move. I was on the move. But when you actually sat there and I walked on the beach and said, you know what? Because he said, I, I don't care. I'm going to hell. I said, and I looked at him and said, but you don't have to go to hell. You know you don't have to go to hell. And he's like, yeah, but I'm going to hell. And I said, but you don't have to go. Yeah, but it's a choice. And I was like, you're right. It's a choice. You can choose to go to heaven. And after I got done walking on the beach with Declan and talking to the Lord and everything, I remember saying, you know what? I bet you, I, I could have made that point where, you know what? I don't think you believe in hell. I really don't, because someone who truly believes that hell exists and, and hell is real and eternal torment and flame, nobody would want to go there if you actually believed it. But I didn't think of this until later. Sometimes we need to walk and talk with the Lord and, and be patient before we give an answer. And that's what I try to do. So, so brothers and Christ, I'll end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and my love for you, my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching. Please keep me in your prayers. Keep uh, my usefulness in the ministry in the prayers. Keep the prayers for the Bibles for the brethren. Okay, that we can still keep getting Bibles for brethren. And I'll throw this out there one more time. Brother Sis Christ, stateside. If there's any of you that wants a nice Bible and you've got an old one that's fallen apart, and you want one of the nice leather ones and everything, please hit, hit this ministry up. I'll put you on the list. And as, you know, as God provides, we provide. You know, I'll provide Bibles if you want some Bibles. If you're seriously hurting, uh, you know, hit me up and talk with me. Okay. Be careful. I get people hitting me up all the time uh, trying to get money on me. I'm not going to just throw money at anybody. But if you come and you talk and we fellowship for a while and I realize that you're a brother in Christ and we're fellowshipping and, and everything and you're in need and you're, you're a brother in Christ that's in need, I'm here. If you need something, come talk to me. Okay, I'm doing my best to try to help out. So that being said, I'll see you in the next videos.